It is always such a great honor to meet everybody here and to come to this class in particular. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace, blessings, and mercy upon you all. In order for me to share my message today, I think it is appropriate again to just give a brief introduction as to who I am, where I come from, and what my reversion story is because it is pinnacle to the message I want to leave with you. I was born and raised in a Christian family, my mother a beautiful singer, and my father the pastor of our church. From a very young age, I've been nurtured by the names of the great prophets, from Abraham and his sons, Noah upon his ship, and Moses with his remarkable courage to lead his people to safety. As I reached my mid-teens, I was met with a burning desire to follow my father's footsteps, to become a religious leader, and thus, I dedicated myself to this cause and soon found a platform upon which I could share my passion for God and what I then believed his untainted revelation. As I reached my early 20s, I found myself in a position of leadership at my church. However, as my independence grew and religious freedom took hold, I started asking questions which were often left unanswered by my religious leaders. It was during this time that my mother had found a copy of the Quran due to a business relationship that had led her to this revelation. Thus, I questioned her quest for additional knowledge, and I started to debate with her, with love and compassion that I have for her. She is my mommy. We often had heated debates regarding Islam, and I did not fully understand why she wanted to go on this quest. And so I realized that my desire to follow in my father's footsteps was starting to wither apart, that I should reevaluate who I want to be in life and what I want to become in life. And so I decided to go overseas to work for Royal Caribbean Cruises abroad. It was at the airport where I was about to leave for my flight that my mom held me in a close, embracing hug. And she prayed a prayer to her new God named Allah, which I will never forget. She held me close and she prayed to this Allah to send a big angel with me, to guide me and to protect me. And as I left for my flights and I landed upon Australia and I boarded my ship, I opened my bag, I realized that my mom had left me with more than just a prayer. She had left me with a copy of the Quran. And on the very first page of this book, she wrote a little note and she said, that if ever I want to debate against Muslims one day, I need to understand their revelation. I need to understand their belief structure. And I need to know where they come from. And so with the love that I have for my mommy, I dedicated myself to reading at least one page every day. And soon one page turned into two, two into three. And I found myself completing the Quran from cover to cover. This was the point at which my battle began. Where my heart and my soul and life was torn. Separated countries between myself and everything that I held dear. I felt lost. And yet I knew I was exactly where I had to be. I felt betrayed by my religious leaders that had guided me for so long. And yet I knew there was still something that was guiding me. I felt like I did not really know God. But I knew He was right there beside me to give me guidance. Having completed the complete Quran, reading about all the prophets that I had internalized for so long, and reading about the message of Jesus Christ within this revelation, 
something struck me which was remarkable. That all these things that I'd now learned is in correspondence with what, what I'd been taught. And yet there is a difference. And so I went back to the Torah and the Gospel to start a comparative study within the Quran. And what I had discovered astonished me. That there's more cohesion between these revelations than what there is separation. From the very core principle of Islam and in the Quran, that there's only one God worthy of worship. Echoed through the Torah and Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 where Moses, peace be upon him, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This being confirmed by Jesus Christ as to what came before him and what was after him. In Mark chapter 12 verse 29, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. As we find, furthermore, in the Torah where it says that nothing in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or the water beneath the earth will ever resemble God, that there's nothing like unto him. Confirmed by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as he stands before his followers and the Pharisees, where he says that you have never seen the shape of God, neither have you ever heard his voice. It was as if I'd been reading a new revelation. Now this is not where my journey ended. This is only where it began where I was able within my heart and within my soul to find and renew myself, to make the kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that there's only one God worthy of worship, who has no partner nor equal, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. It was at this time that I realized that my mission is to work for Allah, that he had guided me from childhood in a religious home, which was from a Christian background, and he had removed my complete foundation and he had to rebuild me as to who I am today and where I stand. The organization I work with now in Dawa is called AERA. And we work with, an, with, with a, an approach in Dawa which is called the Go Rap Method. And inshallah, during the course of the next couple of weeks, when I'm invited again by Mulana, I would like to take you through these steps because it's an easier approach to perform Dawa. Because we know that in ourselves there's an obligation placed upon us to perform Dawah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, in chapter number 16, verse 125, He says, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Look within yourself and ask yourself, When is the last time that you invited somebody towards the deen of Allah? When is the last time you sat down with someone and asked them, who is the God that you believe in? Please tell me more. I want to know. But allow me to also share my belief with you so that you can understand where I come from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran in chapter 41 verse 33, He says that, who is better in speech than he who invites towards Allah and does righteous deeds and says that I am of the Muslims? Let us take this up and understand that this obligation that is placed upon our shoulders is no easy task. But our obligation is merely to plant a seed. Might it be to hold somebody close in an embrace and to pray a prayer with them? Might it be to plant a seed such as putting a Quran in somebody's bag? At the end of the day, you never know what that seed might sprout. It might lead them towards Allah and towards His deen, as it did with me. Within the organization, the first part of performing da'wah is to speak about the existence of God. Now we know in our existence, we have numerous different molecules and things around us that have come together to form certain things that we have in this life. For instance, if I were to pick up the cell phone, and I were to tell you that this phone formed itself over millions and millions of years, due to the fact that it's formed by carbon, it is formed by silver, nickel, it's a little bit of traces of gold in here. It is formed with lithium, the batteries that it holds. If I were to say that this cell phone rationally formed itself, you would think that I am crazy because it is absolutely impossible. And yet, if we look at our creation, just with something so simplistic, our most important sense, our eyes, if we take the eye and we look at the mechanics behind the eye and its miraculous design, there are some people in this world that can say that that must not come from a creator. But how can we say that? Because if a phone cannot form over a million years, how can we expect an eye to form just out of habit? It cannot be. And if we go back to the very points of creation, we understand that every cause has something that is putting it into motion. 
And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he says in Surah Al-Class, in chapter 112, verse 1 to 4, that he is uncreated, that he is absolute and eternal, and that there's nothing like unto him. So we know that if every created thing has a creator, then surely there must be a creator that put everything into motion. And as we have this phone, we know that it was created by something. And therefore we know that due to that process, that we must come from a creator as well. During my time growing into this dean, my belief in God was still stable. But there was still something that was holding me back, and that was the concept of the Trinity. In the Trinity, it's believed that there is only one God, but that this God exists in three different personalities. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is believed that these three are one, that all three of these entities are co-eternal, co-equal, and that all of them are all-powerful, all-knowing, and absolute, omnipresent, and that it has always been and that it always has been. However, through my comparative religious studies between the Torah, the Gospels, and the Quran, I found that I could no longer believe in this concept, but that there is only one Allah, for numerous simple reasons. The very first is, this creator, or this being that is believed to be the Trinity, is to be omnipresent, and yet Jesus, peace be upon him, says that he is a man. He asks his followers and he says that, Here I am, a man standing in front of you. Therefore, he cannot be omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at once. He is bound by flesh. Now, Christian missionaries would argue that no, it's due to the fact that he's still bound by flesh, but once he died, his spirit was let free and therefore he is immortal. However, is it not that we have an immortal soul that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So what is the difference between us and him? He was a man. The second point is, that this entity, all three of this part, these parts, are all-knowing. However, Jesus, peace be upon him, says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, he says that, Of the final day and hour knowest no one, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Therefore, he did not have all knowledge. He does not know when the final day would occur. As every prophet before him, when they were asked that question, it was a test to their prophethood. As Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked that very question by Angel Gabriel as he sat in front of him in the, in the masjid. That is the test. He was not all-knowing. Then therefore, how can he be co-equal to the Father? The final test is that they are all-powerful. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And yet we know that Jesus, peace be upon him, says in John chapter 5, verse 30, Out of my own self, I can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but only him who had sent me. Therefore, it is illogical to believe that the Trinity can be one God. Because Jesus, peace be upon him, declares that he is subservient to his God. As he says that the one that is sent by his master is subservient to the one that had sent him. And finally, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, makes it unambiguous here. In the book of John, chapter 17, verse 3, he says... This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and me whom you have sent. If Jesus, peace be upon him, utters upon his lips that there is only one true God and this true God had sent him, and that the way to get to this true God is through him as a prophet, then how can we believe that he is a God himself? We cannot. The concept of the Trinity is a flawed creation of man, and it was only instituted in the year 325 in the Council of Nicaea by a Roman emperor named Constantine. For the first 300 years after Jesus, peace be upon him, the concept of co-equality between the Father and the Son was non-existent. There is not a single church father that writes that Jesus, peace be upon him, is co-equal to the Father. It did not exist for the first 300 years. Yet, they were combined, yes, but they were not co-equal. They were taken into unity as we would take into unity a prophet and the Rabb, our creator, our sustainer. Because we know that the way to get to our Creator is through following the footsteps of the prophets that were sent to us. And Alhamdulillah, we were given an amazing prophet to follow. Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it was from that moment that I had internalized this lifestyle within myself. That I had learned how to perform da'wah and how to speak to people. Because all too often we believe in ourselves that we need to be an Amadidad or Zakir Naik in order to perform da'wah. That is not the truth. Yeah, you have an example of a cell phone to bring people to the creation of Allah, to bring people to his concept, 
to bring people to his majesty and in his belief. Here we have the concept of the Trinity that is a fallacy that did not exist for the first 300 years. And inshallah, as we com complete this program that is in Gorab, the next points being the revelation and then the prophethood. We will discuss this in further detail. And inshallah, we can even go into every single one of these points and flesh that out to allow you to go out there and to invite people to the way of Allah. And please, sisters, I try and I ask you now, as my mummy just took one simple step of faith by putting it around in my back, truly, Jana lies at your footsteps. And this is the truth. For me, Jana lied at the footsteps of my mummy. Go out there, invite your family, love them, take care of them. And inshallah, Allah will grow that seed that you place within their hearts. Amen. Amen. I would like to give you an opportunity to ask any dawah related question. Anything that might have happened in my past. If it's personal questions, feel free. I'm not opposed to answering anything. And then you're more than welcome to ask any related questions and I will try to answer to the best of my ability, inshallah. Shukran so much for this opportunity as always. And there's many points that we can pick up, but the point that touched me the most of Ashraf's speech is the step that his mother took. Amen. Give him the Quran and to encourage him to study the Quran. Amen. And that's where the power is. The power is with you as the woman, the mother. Amen. And the womb under whose feet Jannah lays. Okay. And if you look at it, the Prophet said, Jannah lays at the feet of every mother. It's you, the mother, who can take your family to the Jannah. Like his mom took the step and decided that I will love my son and I want to have my son with me in Jannah and therefore it's important that I give him the right message. The beautiful thing of Shukran for a very beautiful and profound message. Mm -hmm.